In this episode, we speak with Megan Garner, a fourth grade math teacher from Liberty Hill, Texas. Megan is just in her fifth year of teaching and is aiming her sights on helping her students develop flexible strategies around division and other basic number sense skills. But, you know, she's finding it a little frustrating when mm. students want to always resort to that standard algorithm. Yeah, so together we're going to help Megan see how starting with models and strategies before rushing to algorithms will help to strengthen students' proficiency and flexibility. Mm -hmm. This is another Math Mentoring Moment episode where we get to chat with a member of the Math Moment Maker community, just like you, who's working through problems of practice. And together, we brainstorm possible next steps and strategies to overcome them. Here we go. Welcome to the Making Math Moments That Matter podcast. I'm Kyle Pierce. And I'm John Orr. We are two math teachers from MakeMathMoments.com who together with you, the community of math moment makers worldwide who want to build and deliver problem-based math lessons that spark curiosity, fuel sense making and ignite your teacher moves welcome everyone to another math mentoring moment episode with mm -hmm. a fellow math moment maker just like you and uh, john i don't know about you but chatting with someone who's been teaching for five years yet is pushing so deeply into mm -hmm. trying to ensure their students have more than just the algorithm is something that like makes me feel so great about where we're headed for math education. Uh, I, I went, I don't know. I mean, I do know about you, John. I know your story. So I do know this about you, but I feel like it took you mm -hmm. and I a lot longer to see that math class was more than just sort of memorizing and mimicking the steps and the procedures. You know, and and just from saying that and, and noticing that uh, with all the teachers, you know, so many teachers we talk with on the podcast, I think there's a lot in that boat too, Kyle, which means mm -hmm. I feel like there's there's a lot of momentum for for teacher change, for math instruction change, especially happening at younger ages. And so imagine these younger teachers, like you're saying, we didn't do that for the first 10 years of our career, but we've got a whack of teachers who are doing that. And uh, think of the wave that's going to happen as they get older and then they, you know, they, they've got the, that skill set even far deeper than we have our skill set because they started mm -hmm. so much earlier. So excited for this wave and to be part of that wave coming uh, coming to the to our future. So uh, excited for that. Now let's jump into this episode because we chat with Megan um, all about kind of flexibility strategies, fluency strategies, how best to get your students to understand that they can use multiple strategies. And uh, so we, we talk all about that. Uh, we want to uh, to share that conversation with you. So let's get to it. Yeah. And uh, hey, listen, if you've got time, flip over to YouTube to check this out, because later right. on, we actually dig in with the document camera. So uh, if you want a little more context here, a little more visuals to go along with it, uh, hit us up on YouTube. But otherwise, listen in and here we go. Hey there, Megan. Thanks uh, for joining us here on the Making Math Moments That Matter podcast. Uh, how are you doing this evening? I'm doing well. How are y'all doing? Awesome. Awesome. Um, and uh, do us a favor and uh, do our listeners a favor. Let us know, um, you know, wh where are you coming from? Um, what uh, What's your teaching role look like right now? And fill us in a little backstory on uh, on the teaching journey thus far. All right, so I am a fourth grade math and science teacher in a town called Liberty Hill in Texas. It's about 30 minutes from Austin. Um, this is my fifth year teaching, and I have done, I did third grade, then fifth grade, and now fourth, so kind of right in the sweet spot in the middle. Um, and I, I've been lucky enough to teach math every year, um, and I just recently started teaching science as well. Awesome, awesome. So you've had some experience, so you've been teaching math it sounds like for the most part, um, for your entire schedule, now you're doing some science as well. How are you liking that? Like, do you, would you rather be just going straight up math so you could focus or are you kind of liking the variety? Um, man, my boss will probably hear this. No, um, I do like having <laughs> the variety. I do. Um, I'm very aware of how much I love math and I feel like I'm very strong at math and understanding the 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 um, the content and just kind of digging deep into it. And I need to get there with science. Uh, I don't think I'm a bad science teacher. I just, 
I know that, man, I am stronger on the math side. Uh, there you go. There you go. I'm, I'm definitely, I, I love getting people's perspectives on that. I know that there's some educators who they just love being with the same group of students all day long and kind of rolling from one subject to the other, but I'm definitely the advocate of, you know, sticking to a subject area so that you can really dig in, really understand. And I think with math, especially, uh, I was just working with my son upstairs before I hopped on and he struggles with spelling. And I I realize working with him, how little I know about helping students understand how to spell. So I can only imagine, you know, again, if I had to teach all the different subject areas. So uh, thanks for uh, giving us a little perspective there. Uh, Before we dig any deeper, we want to roll back into your past, into your math experience. Uh, it sounds like you're kind of enjoying this role as a math educator. Go back to that uh, K to 12 experience. What would be that math moment that pops out in your mind? Is it positive? Is it negative? Is it somewhere in between? Take us on that journey. It is definitely positive. Um, y'all, I remember the exact location. I remember where I was when I learned about variables. Um, I was in a, a fourth grade. A fourth Doesn't grade everybody though? Doesn't everybody? I mean, I, I feel like it's not always positive, but hopefully, I don't know. Um, but I remember they gave us um, balances and they gave us um, two different colored ponds and they were like, like, explore them. And they, you know, they had different weights and mm-hmm. we're messing with them. And finally, we're like, we wanted to balance it and eventually figured out like two red ponds is equal to three blue. And I was just like, hey, my mind was blown. That right mm-hmm. there. I like, it was it was a puzzle. Um, there were two things that looked identical, but they, they represented something that was a number and I knew it was a number, but what I was looking at wasn't a number and it just completely opened up a whole nother world of math and possibilities for me. Huh. That's, uh, that's it. That is very, very interesting. And I'm wondering if you could, uh, you could elaborate a little bit more on that, like a world of possibilities for us, uh, before we kind of venture forward. Uh, what do you, what do you mean by that? How did that take you and, and what did, how did that kind of open doors or, or what did that look like for you after it was like, oh my gosh. I, I really wish I knew what, um, instruction looked like in the classroom when I was, you know, say a fourth grader, um, just, because I, I feel like I had been learning it and it was probably a lot of just memorizing things and just kind of drill it in and lots of worksheets. Um, and in that moment, I realized that I had done, I had seen a puzzle. I'd seen a math mm-hmm. problem that I had never seen before. I'd never seen anything like it. Mm-hmm. And I was able to solve it. And I realized in that moment that you could represent things mathematically that weren't necessarily, they didn't look mathematical on the surface. And it just, you know, as a, as a, t- a person, you know, that's not a teacher, like outside of here, out in the wild, um, I think mathematically, um, if I'm running, I'm like, man, I'm one eighth of the way done, you know, now I'm two thirds, <laughs> right. you know, just kind of just assessing everything that I see and I do mm. through a mathematical lens. Um, it, gosh, it just, it really, mm-hmm. it helps me feel grounded. I feel like when I can mathematically assess the situation, it, I know where I'm at and I know where I need to go. And it, mm. for me, I need that in my life. Um, right. <laughs> The I analytical love- mind. Yeah, the ma- math is like a. I like a math is like a grounding. You know, it keeps us. It keeps us. Uh, you know, level. It keeps us. You know, humble, but also it keeps us kind of moving forward in a sense. Um, and I think these things stick out. You know, they they stick with us for reasons, and they stick with us for. You know, you've given us a reason here, but I think I think these other. You know, these these moments stick with us into our teaching journey as well like how do you think that that moment has influenced your teaching style in the classroom so i i don't think that it really influenced me to start off with i think i mm-hmm, i kind of mm-hmm. was um i did the alternative certification and i started in january when i was first hired and i was just kind of thrown in right i um, and just kind of finding my feet as i was going For um sure. and I, I was kind of just going with what people were giving me. And the more that I've, um, I talk a lot. Um, I talk with people though, with the kids, with the students, I um, and just talking with them about how I see things and how I analyze things and having those discussions with them has really helped me understand how that particular moment shaped me and how powerful it was. And so empowering for me to be able to do that on my own. And I in turn want to give that back to the students. Um, mm. And uh, I think, um, and that's part of the reason I had this pebble in my shoe <laughs> and I sent in the question is um, 
you know, I think about math in so many different ways whenever I'm looking at questions and, you know, if I'm solving it in my head while they're working on something at their desk, um, I realize that I'm doing things that I want them to be able to do. And I just want to um, be better to fully execute that and, um, and make it happen for my mm -hmm. students, if that makes sense. I love it. You know, you, I, I was going to ask you for a quick win here, but you've sort of already, I feel like you've given sort of a, a quick win in terms of even just your own math moment and how you want to bring that out in your students. So I, I can almost envision what that probably looks like and sounds like in your classroom. So let's start digging in here a little bit. I'm wondering, can you, can you dive a little deeper there? Because we are going to ask you, we're, we're curious about that pebble in particular, what, like maybe start with like, what's going well, and then maybe we can kind of shift to where maybe that pebble starts sort of showing up in that shoe, you know, where, where things start becoming maybe more challenging or more difficult along the way. Do you mind taking us on a, a bit of that journey? Yeah. So I, for many years, I, I struggled with looking at the, at the teach, looking at the skills and it's saying, you know, students had to be able to show mastery solving a problem two different ways. And I was like, why would I spend twice as long teaching them to solve it with a standard algorithm and with the expanded form or whatever the other might be, mm -hmm. just so they can answer it two different ways on the test. I was like, that did not seem like a good use of time. And I didn't really feel like I was doing um, doing a whole lot of good <laughs> by by doing that. And I don't remember specifically what episode it was that I listened to. Um, but it was talking about the, um, I don't remember this, all, but talking about the mental math and then um, the fluency versus automaticity episode changed my life, y'all. Thank you. <laughs> um, and, and just understanding, I think that's probably what was intended when the teaks were written. They just, no one had explained it to me like that. And just understanding that the the fluency and what I really want them to be able to do is to look at a problem and um, be able to determine reasonableness and determine which strategy works well for them that that's really where I want to go with it because I mean I've been drilling in you know your your standard algorithm and your traditional methods for years um, but it's just not going to work like that for everybody but I think I just want to explore how how do I best meet the needs of kids that see it different ways and then I in talking to them, I've realized that I see problems multiple different ways when I'm looking at them. And I mm -hmm. quickly choose the strategy that I know is going to work best in that moment. And I just mm -hmm. want to know how to get them to that point to where they have the confidence and the knowledge and the skills to make that happen. Gotcha. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Um, what are, what, uh, Megan, what are you, what are you doing currently, uh, in the classroom to kind of you know, you're, you're witnessing this pebble, you're, you're feeling the pebble. And right now you're probably like all of us who, when we have these pebbles, we kind of try to shake them loose a little bit and, and see what happens. And so what is that shake look like for you right now? So I've, um, when we come in, I have kind of my warm up routine and in there, um, two or three days a week, I have, um, a puzzle up there that has, um, five different lines and different pictures, just like images that, it's from mashup math. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. From there. Um, and y'all won't believe this, but I, I have them give me a variable so I don't have to redraw those pictures when we're solving it. <laughs> and right. where I've gotten to now after the first few months of going through and solving them is whenever we have two variables on the same side of the equation, I'm like, how could we rewrite that possibly using the inverse operation to solve it? So we have, um, you know, we plug in a value that we've just figured out and now we only have one variable and it's on one side of the equation and what we know is on the other. And so I'm kind of exploring with them, looking at a picture and then realizing what it's asking and then how are we actually going to solve it? I feel like when they see the the shift from one side of the equation to the other, it helps hmm. them kind of expand on that flexibility. Yeah, that it's interesting because, you know, kind of going all the way back to your initial reference of some of the standards around multi, you know, it sounds like multiple representations, right? Being able to be mm -hmm. fluent and flexible with say two approaches, a uh, standard algorithm and maybe some other approach. And, you know, here it sounds like in that activity, you're, you're really trying to draw on again, that fluency and that flexibility piece. Like you're trying to ensure that students aren't just, you know, solving it the same way every single time, but actually like, Hey, what happens when we do this? Or, Hey, what happens when we do that? Um, what, 
so when you're doing that sort of activity, where is, you know, where is this, this challenge sort of emerging for you? Where, like, where are you getting hung up? Where do you feel like is, are, are you feeling like you're losing students? Are students having a hard time understanding why it's important to, you know, be flexible or fluent here? Take us a little deeper. I don't, I don't think any of them have realized um, I wouldn't say any. I don't think most of them have realized why it's important to be kind of fluid and flexible with it. I I do have a few kiddos that have really latched onto it. Like I have one friend that he just multiplication facts are just they're not sticking. Um, and he has he is very very good at you know taking one of the factors. We're gonna split it in half, and then even if he doesn't know the half, he's like, oh, if it's a double of something, I know that I can add my doubles instead of multiplying by two. Like he's got that down, and he builds his way back up and he is one kiddo that is really like taken off like night and day difference. Um, Most of my kids that are able to kind of rearrange the equations, I feel like they just think it's fun, which is okay with me. Mm -hmm. If somebody Mm -hmm. thinks math is fun. Right. Um, And then I have some other kiddos that they see it. And I know that um, the information is sinking in, but it's not, um, it's not something that they're wanting to in turn try on their own um, to do later. An example, Mm -hmm. like right now we're doing, um, they just started learning long division. That's what we do in, in fourth grade here. Um, and we just introduced remainders. And one of the questions required them to do 30 divided by seven. And most of my kids were like, okay, going to do some long division here for 30 divided by seven. And I was like, let's think about it. Let's think about what you guys know. And just kind of getting them to realize that that is not always the, the most efficient option for solving mm. a problem. Mm, okay. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 I see, I see a little bit of, of what's, what's happening here, Megan. And, and I think I'm, I'm curious about when you present these puzzles, these problems, um, what students are working, you know, in, in it, you're probably witnessing, you know, like you said, some students are maybe solving them in different ways and, and some aren't, and they're kind of just resorting back to a particular strategy. I'm curious what, your uh what your what your le- like what what does the kind of the consolidation or the connect part of of your your lesson look like for you um in the in the sense that I, i'm trying to see that the problems presented kids are working and then when you're seeing solutions what is your move next if um so when we're doing that, it's a it's a whole group type mm-hmm. work. Um, so so you're always, so everyone's doing it. You're taking stretch suggestions from yeah. the big group, and you're maybe modeling that up on the board from what the group is, make, is saying. And it's a it's a no pencil time. Like I don't want you writing on your paper. I don't want you figuring out stuff on your paper. I want what's to talk about it. And everything I'm presenting is um, things that could be done with mental math or with estimation, and we could get there. Um, so that's how it's. Um, that's how it's presented. Um, and I, the pencils weren't always like a, a no at that time, um, but I saw a lot of kids that were still going with the one way that they knew. And I really wanted them to focus on not so much getting it right and getting it done quickly, but how else can we, can we do it? Mm-hmm. I, and okay. what did, go, ahead, yeah, go ahead, John. Oh, okay. I was just going to say, I was like, so I'm imagining, okay, so you're bringing these strategies from them and, and maybe are you interjecting with any ideas yourself in that same math talk time? I am happy to report that I've been able to kind of pass the torch somewhat and we're getting better at it. It's been Mm -hmm. um, probably about two months since I started really asking them, like, let's look, how can we rearrange this so that it looks like a, an equation that we're used to solving. Right. Um, And if it's any kind of repeated addition, I'm like, no, 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 no. What, what else can we do? What's more efficient? Those poor kids are like, Oh, this guy is talking about efficiency again. (laughs) Like, what can we do? Right. Right. And so, so what I'm hearing is, is, you know, you're, you're feeling, you're feeling some successes in, in small pockets here. So what, what, this is often something that we think about when we have pebbles and and I think about when I have pebbles is I ask myself like, what is it, does it make me feel like what I'm doing isn't the right thing? Like what isn't working? Um, Because you're, you're, you're describing some, some, some great moments here. Um, And then Mm -hmm. you're still going like, oh, this is not, this is, you know, it's not, it's not it, but how do you know it's not it? And, you know, I'll see like today I had a student that was doing 30, 
30 minus 28 and we got um what they get they got 12 and I know that if they'd have just been like oh if I'm at 28 I only need two more to get to 30 and if they'd have just thought about it a different way we we wouldn't have needed to even write it down um to do it but we did and then that brought in you know struggles with regrouping and it just showed an underlying issue that is is bigger than just the regrouping just the not understanding the the relative values and that they are they have more skills that they can use and they're just kind of stuck in a rut hmm. Hmm. Okay. interesting does that make sense yeah no totally doesn't i'm wondering i want to dig just a tiny bit deeper um into let's say the actual problems students are solving here i'm curious would you say that the problems are typically um, with context? So like a contextual problem, uh, you know, where there's, you know, we'll call it like a story problem where, you know, the these quantities are representative of something in, you know, that you can Im imagine in your head, like, it, you know, they're, they're dealing with apples or they're dealing with, you know, whatever that context might be. Would you say it's more contextless, or sometimes we call it like naked problems, where you know they're they're just they're operating or they're solving or they're evaluating, uh, or is it somewhere in between? What what would you say if you had to sort of pick one of those three options there? Um, I would say we're still at the stage where I'm seeing these types of struggles with just the computation, like no word problem or context in there. Um, the way our units are kind of set up is they're they're fairly isolated at the beginning and what's coming up next is going to be the all our operations where we're really assessing um, the situation and what type of um, problem it actually is. I mean, we talk about it and I, I talk about it all year, but as far as um, where I see the error pattern starting, it's definitely still at the computation level. I don't think that the the context is necessarily contributing to that. Interesting. I was actually, you know what? I'm I'm more curious. Is it like, are are you giving them contextual problems or not? Oh, yeah. Not that it's adding to the the problem. I'm wondering, like, are they are you starting with context or are you starting mm -hmm. more with just computation problems? And then once they've achieved a certain level of success with computation problems, then we add in, you know, the context or the storyline. I would say we're probably doing um, two, maybe three days if I'm introducing something new, like long, long division um, with just the computation and then adding in the word problems. Um, I feel like, especially for fourth grade and division, um, this is a whole nother world for them. Like we were dividing within a hundred before and it was something they could kind of um, think about on their own. I feel like it, it was overwhelming seeing the bigger numbers and I wanted to give them mm. a couple days of just kind of exploring it first. Right. Right. I'm so I'm yeah. And I'm kind of wondering, like, let's use long division as an example when you're introducing. So let's say you're introducing long division. What might a problem sound like? Like you had given the 30 divided by, I can't remember if it was like eight seven. Or, or seven. Yeah. It would that be sort of like your starter is like, Hey, like 30 and divided by seven to introduce long division or what, what might that look like or sound like? We started with, um, multiples of 10 and multiples of a hundred of the basic, um, within 100 multiplication facts. So like we know that, you know, 25 divided by five is five. So then we're like going back to the place value knowledge. So 250 divided by five is going to be 10 times greater started with that super before cool before we before we went in so with the compatible numbers um and then we we also expanded upon compatible numbers and exploring the difference between rounding versus a true compatible number to kind of get a reasonable to just um, justify reasonableness for our answer interesting interesting now would you be modeling that for them like because mm -hmm. you know that they could figure it out so it, it's interesting because you know, something that kind of jumps out at me is this, at least if I was to like maybe articulate what I'm hearing this challenge is involving or this pebble in your shoes involving is like, it's like we're introducing these algorithms or these procedures like long division. And, but then it seems like sometimes the question doesn't fit the algorithm. Like it's, it doesn't seem like a good, it doesn't seem like a reasonable 
um, time to use the algorithm, but then students are trying to use it in some cases instead of maybe using other strategies. Would that would that be sort of highlighting that that pebble in in a nutshell? That or? was one that that was one that came up today, but I, I think I see good rich discussions happening with the compatible numbers and just understanding you know multiples of ten and how we can use that to um, to understand if our answer is anywhere close to correct. But then once the discussions are gone and or the discussions are over and they're not at my table or not working with me, it's like we've forgotten that we had that skill. And I'm struggling with getting them to understand the um, the importance of it. And then on the other end, I have kids that are like, oh, I can just estimate. I don't have to show my work on anything. And they just kind of go on <laughs> and they round everything after that. And I think that was the kind of the, the anarchy I was alluding to whenever <laughs> I sit in that pebble. I was like, I... I have kiddos that aren't aren't utilizing it when I, I know that if I'm there with them and supporting them, they can. And then I have other kids that are like, oh, yeah, that's the only way to go. I don't I'm going to use middle math for everything and I'm out of here. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> my own kid included. My goodness, y'all. Right. Right. My own kid. <laughs> Megan, so if if we gave you a if we gave you like a magic wand that that took you into the future and the problem that, you know, the pebble is solved. It's, it's, it's already, it's already solved, right? It's like, you've got it figured out. It's ready to go. I want you to imagine what does your, what does your classroom look like on these math talks? Like, what do you, what should that look like for you? Just the, the being able to tell me how and why they got their answer. Just you know, I got this, you know, I multiplied these two numbers. I knew I needed to multiply because I saw equal groups and I was looking for the total. Mm -hmm. And I chose this because I chose this solution and I got there this way. Yeah. I don't think there's one specific, um, there's, there isn't a specific answer what, that I want. I just want them right. to feel comfortable and confident. I guess that, that's really what I want. Got it. Now, when you see what they wrote on the on their board or on their desk, or maybe they're mm -hmm. telling you, right? Um, uh, I I I often ask my students to draw, write as much as they can before mm -hmm. they tell me. Um, what does that look like right now? Like, just imagine. It doesn't have to be that problem you talked about, but just imagine. Like, what is it? What is? It, what are you seeing? It, like, we've already got the answer. It's already in there. They're flexible. They're 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 ready to go. They're about to tell you, what does that look like on their desk or their paper? I I feel like I'm at the point where um, having groups of three or four kind of work together and I've strategically kind of grouped them at their desk working together. Um, I'm at the point where that's where I feel like I get the richest conversation and I get the most mm -hmm. out of it for everybody. Um, and I do, like I said, when they're working together, they're working with me, I, I'm getting I'm getting decent answers. Um, but it's when when we take that away that it's not it's not happening right. for everybody. What do those answers look like though on pages? Is it just calculations or are there Oh no no pictures? I make them write it. I tell them they are in the math court of law and their answer is gonna justify their position and they better convince me and the jury that their answer is right and tell me yeah, why. <laughs> right. Um we, right. we do a writing prompt every week. So I start them at um on Monday with a quick check for what we're doing for the week. Our goal, we, it's not graded like going on report cards, but we work towards mastery throughout the week. And then one of the assignments they have to do before they take their quiz at the end of the week is a writing assignment where I'm, it's, it's almost never requiring them to complete any sort of computation, but it's digging deeper into the how and the why um, behind a concept. And then they, um, they switch journals with somebody and they have a rubric and they do a peer review um, and kind of graded on content and clarity and where we use an academic vocabulary. And I tell them, like, if you can write about math, you can do it. Um, for some of them, I think they still think I'm quite evil, um, but we're getting there. <laughs> I love it. I love uh, it. I, yeah, go ahead, go ahead, John. I was just going to toss in, like, when I, when I imagine my students to be flexible and fluent, um, uh, which means they're they're swapping out strategies when one doesn't work or when they look at the numbers, they're they're seeing, you know, like this strategy might be better here. I might be able to decompose these two things here because I'm looking at the numbers. When I when I imagine that kind of 
solution in the future of of seeing what what's written on their desk. I'm I'm usually imagining in my mind uh visuals that accompany say these strategies. Mm-hmm. So so when we talk about models um we talk about strategies that go with those models like when we're working with proportions are we drawing number lines that show scaling in tandem along those number lines um and students don't come up with these on their own what happens is when we speak answers um we kind of we kind of do an automatic like start to draw these models that help them understand their strategies that that uh, they can be visually represented. Um, if you're doing multiplying, you're drawing an area model. But when they talk about, oh, I multiplied these two things together, I'm at the board kind of going, oh, can I can I draw it this way? Like you're you're describing this, you know, you're describing multiplying these okay. these two these two two digit numbers together, or maybe you're dividing these digit numbers. I'm gonna draw this 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 area here, and I'm gonna I'm gonna you know, when you say this, when, you know, this multiplied by this and there's this many groups, can I, is it okay if I draw like this many things here and this many things? I, I find that when I mimic or not mimic, but model their thinking using visual models that I want them to use so that they can be flexible, okay. it it puts it in their mind. It, it, it puts mm-hmm. them in their mind. So that the next time they, they go to do a problem, I see them drawing those models because okay. mo- mo- a lot of the times they won't draw uh, visual representations of some of the thinking and the strategies um, until they see me model it for them using mm-hmm. those. And then it kind of spirals from there. Um, that might be something that can be in your arsenal is is start to think about how can I represent their thinking since you're already doing these great math, math talks and hearing great strategies, giving them a tool that they can use to be flexible, like say an area model if you're multiplying a number mm-hmm. line, if you're if you're thinking about proportions or counting or multiplying um, any any okay. sort of uh, tandem quantities. Um, Kyle, Kyle, what do you think about m- this model strategy uh, moving forward for Megan? I I was right with you there, John. I had this all prepped up here. I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna pin this here, spotlight this for a second. And those who are listening, you can check this out on YouTube. But you know, just kind of going back even to this idea as well, like something that kind of jumped out at me, which I was envisioning myself in the classroom when I was asking about the context piece because. What we tend to do, or at least what I used to do and the way I remember learning was, you know, we start with calculations and then we slowly add context later. And this is sort of something that John and I have been on a journey to realize that actually context is sort of the glue that allows students to understand what's happening, which allows them to build more flexibility. So if my end goal and on on the screen for those who are with us, if my end goal is long division, there's a a couple things that I can do in order to get that to emerge in my classroom. I could ask students, and now here's the tough part with division. My my first question is, what type of division do I want to elicit here? Because if I just say seven divided, you know, or thirty divided by seven, there's two ways we can look at that. When I add context, it becomes more clear because I could say that I have 30 apples and I want to divide 30 apples into seven baskets, which this will one, reveal. This one did have context. Oh, Sorry, did. my apologies. Okay. This, oh. this one did, but there were other ones that didn't. This one, um, I have 30 cupcakes. My, my joke is always cupcakes. Like I'm always talking about okay. eating cupcakes. I was like, I have 30 cupcakes and I want to eat the same amount every day for seven days. And then I gave them two questions because we just started interpreting remainders and it was how many will I be able to eat each day? How many would be left over? I love it. So now if I want to come at this now, maybe you, you guide me here because um, this particular problem, if it did have context, amazing. My wonder is, did you ask them to solve the problem before introducing long division? Or did you say, here's long division. Now I want you to try this problem. Or what did that look like or sound like? Because maybe uh, maybe I, I've got it wrong in my head of how that might have looked or sounded. This was this is week three of long division, but this is week one of um, remainders. And this is the first time they've been introduced to remainders. Um, so numbers are smaller. Um, and I, I did not anticipate that we would go straight to long division for, you know, seven or 30 divided by seven. And I, I did not see that, that bump in the road coming. 
Oh, interesting. Okay. okay. Now, I guess my I guess my wonder would be is like let's let let's pretend for a second that we were just introducing long division. If I'm introducing long division, what I'm what I want to do is not introduce it at all and actually have kids solve it with whatever tool they have. Cause what, what I think I heard you say was, you know, you were, your, your challenge was like students were using maybe an algorithm when maybe there was other methods that mm-hmm. could have helped them get there. So one of the, one of the keys when we're introducing an algorithm is to make sure that they're really fluent with other strategies that are going to get closer to how that algorithm actually works. So for example, if, if we're looking at, you know, seven days, if I look at it this way and go, okay, well, I have seven days. Um, and some students might even think, okay, well, if it's seven days, then it's like, oh my goodness. Okay. Well, seven is not fun to partition, but I'm going to do it, <laughs> do my best anyway. So there's three, four, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven days, just like that. And I'm trying to figure out like, hmm, all together, all of these days are going to require 30 cupcakes in total here. What I don't know is actually how many are in each one. And what you're doing when you're asking this particular problem, 30 cupcakes, seven days, I want to have the same number per day. That's actually revealing a rate, which makes that partitive division. So I'm going to take the 30 cupcakes, I'm going to chop them into seven different groups. So you can kind of see the groups outlined here. Mm -hmm. If kids don't know the algorithm, they're probably going to do something like this. Some kids might fair share and they go, okay, well, like one for you, one for you all the way through. Okay. Seven are used up. Maybe they go, okay, now 14 are used up. Oh, some kids might go, wait, 14. I know 14 plus another 14 Mm -hmm. is going to be 28. Oh my gosh. There's going to be four in each group. Yeah. I think my struggle was that my my students that um, are still working on mastering um, long division didn't realize that they had this tool in their pocket. And I, I feel like I'm having good math talks and I feel like I'm, I'm showing them different things. And I, I don't know how to get them over the hump to where they remember and they, they're using that and they know that they can. Well, and, and I guess that's kind of where I'm, I want to lead this conversation is, and this is only an idea and only you'll be able to like test this theory out in your classroom because we're not there. And we only hear, you know, this very small segment of, of what's going on in the classroom. But my, my wonder is whether the algorithm maybe was introduced maybe too soon before students were actually flexible and fluent using the strategies and the models. So on the screen here, we have the array is the model that I've used. Now, for a lot of students, it's not going to start as an array. Like what a lot of kids are going to do is go, you know, seven. You're going to get circles. (laughs) Yeah. Right. And this is where like we as the educator have a lot of work to do to help them go, okay, listen, it's fine to go like, you know, one for you, one for you, one for you and do this. But wow, imagine if we could get this more organized. You talked about efficiency earlier. Like mm-hmm. the kids are like, oh, there's that efficiency word. <laughs> like we can be more efficient here and it doesn't have to be long division. More efficient from here would be taking all of these different cupcakes out of these circles and putting them into rows and columns to help students emerge this idea of the array. And they need to be really flexible with that model before moving to an algorithm. Otherwise they're like, well, geez, if, if this feels like I'm memorizing it because I'm not fluent with the array yet, and then you introduce this algorithm, they're going to be like, what's the one most recently that we used? It's long division. So I'm going to go there and, and long division works. Right. But the key would be when I can get to a place where kids are like, they can pull out this strategy, mm-hmm. this model. In this particular case, the array is the model, but the strategy might be fair sharing that they one by one fair shared, or maybe they did two by two fair sharing. That would be the strategy. Once they've got that down where it's like second nature, then and only then do we start to now help them see how this actually works over here, where you start to go, wait a second, what did we do first? We put one in each group. Okay. So I went one cupcake times seven days. 
And over to the side, I go, okay, I just want to mark that down. It's like, wait, so I used up seven cupcakes. I'm going to put them right here. And let's figure out how much do I have left? Oh, I've got, wait a second, 23 cupcakes left. And I go, okay, what did we do again? We we fair shared another, another seven cupcakes. Okay, now I've got less cupcakes to work or to work with. So now I'm at 16 cupcakes. What did we do then? We went, wait a second, these two groups right here, if you remember, for those who are listening, mm-hmm. you're like, what's he talking about? But these two <laughs> groups right here, we knew we're 14 and we're like, wait a second, there's another 14 in here. That's two cupcakes per day. That's that extra 14. And now we have these two remainder left over. All we've done now with this long division is we've done their strategy that they used. And we help them to see that their strategy is baked into long division. They're actually they're they're actually not different. The model is different. This one's very symbolic, but you'll notice this one's more flexible. It's not like the traditional long division algorithm. You'll notice I chunked it in a very friendly way to really help them see we did one row, we did one uh, group, uh, sorry, one cupcake per day. Then we did another cupcake per day. And then we did two cupcakes per day. And you can see that one cupcake, one cupcake, two cupcakes, And all of a sudden, it's like, wait a second, all the same numbers are emerging. Here's a seven. There's a seven. Here's 14 right here. There it is right there. Seven, seven, 14. And we had 28 and there's two left over. I've got the same exact math happening here with a different model, a different representation that we have here. So I guess in summary, what I'm wondering is if there's maybe a topic coming up where you're like, hmm, I've got to get them to this algorithm, to this procedure, but I don't want to find myself in the same situation where students are sort of going like, forget everything else I've ever done in my life. And now I'm only going to use this one Mm -hmm. thing. I wonder if that, you know, maybe taking it a little slower, like John and I call it like avoiding the rush to the algorithm, not saying avoiding algorithms, but avoiding the rush to getting to the algorithm, I think is maybe something that might give, you know, students maybe a little bit more time to actually build in that fluency and flexibility versus maybe just going, okay, I'm just going to go to the last strategy that we focused on because it's got to be the most efficient, right? Like that's the assumption that students make. What are your thoughts there? um, Yeah, I'm glad tomorrow's on Saturday so I can um, put this into use tomorrow. I love it. I do. Um, And I can see how doing that for for all of them, you know, divisions, the last algorithm we're going to be really tackling in fourth grade. Everything after that is um, like geometry and other things like that. Um, I can see how if I had started that sooner, it would have huge, huge payoff whenever it came time to um, like the all operations unit where we're really having to think and assess the situation and how that could help. Um, so I'm just going to work on a plan to to undo any damage I did with algorithms this year. Well, <laughs> never, <it>. never <laughs> look at it as damage. Right. It's definitely not. It, it all, but one thing that you could do because even though you might not have necessarily a new algorithm coming up, maybe the next time, say, for example, long division, next time that comes up, maybe you intentionally give them a problem. Maybe a lot of kids go straight for the algorithm. Maybe you model it with another model, whether it's the array or like John said, maybe the number line, whatever tool you think is going to be helpful for that particular context, and then help them to explicitly see the connection. And I I have a funny feeling, a sneaky suspicion that if you do it sort of like what we just did here, where they're like, oh my gosh, like they might not realize how closely connected they really are. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I say that is because I taught for 15 years and I had no idea that there was another way to show what long division, like how long division worked. I just, I just never asked a question. I just did it. And that was it. But now I'm like, wow, when I see those representations and going all the way back to the initial struggle of like showing it in multiple ways, like, you know, helping kids to see why that's valuable. And, you know, the way 
I used to think as well was like, why would I spend double the time doing it two different ways? It's like to actually strengthen that connection, the, the connections that we make between those representations can actually be the thing that sort of keeps kids grounded, especially when things get hard or too abstract down the road. Oh, I am so excited. <laughs> um, they they worked on that problem yesterday um, and some of them finished it up today. So when they come in tomorrow, that, that 30 divided by seven is fresh on their mind. And I, I'm ready to have that moment where they're just like, mind is blown. Like, awesome. Oh, awesome. oh, I can't wait. Thank do, you so much. Do you promise to let us know how it yeah. goes? Yeah, for sure. Awesome. Yeah. Um, and I promise to keep <laughs> using that strategy. Um, man, this has been so awesome. Thank y'all so much. No problem. No problem. Okay. We're glad that uh, you've got your next step ready to go, even ready for tomorrow. And that's something that uh, that Kyle and I constantly think about is what what model or what strategy can we highlight here before we jump into that algorithm? So, so moving into geometry, moving into, you know, measurement also take that same approach. Like how can I hold back on the main strategy first and then think about what, what can help uh, my students kind of move towards that. So, uh, uh, Megan, sounds like, sounds like you've got some, some great next steps uh, for you. And uh, we want to thank you for joining us on, uh, joining us here and uh if, if if uh if uh you you'd have us we'd love to have you back let's say oh uh i don't know tomorrow uh, maybe no. near the <laughs> yeah maybe near the end maybe near the end of the school year and we can hear we can hear all some more successes and some more pebbles what do you say about that yes 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 that would be amazing Awesome. Awesome. That's fantastic, Megan. It's been a pleasure having you on uh, to, and again, uh, we, we don't say it enough, but to our math mentoring moment guests to be vulnerable and come in with a pebble and to chat about it because so many people, again, listen, we get so many uh, emails, comments, things like that, where people say, wow, I was struggling with that same issue. I'm so happy that mm -hmm. someone was brave enough to come on and share it with the world. So thank you on behalf of the Math Moment Maker community. And uh, hey, we're wishing you all the best. Let us know how things go. Super curious to see if that helps you take one step in uh, in the right direction or continue in that direction, I should say, right. uh, towards that uh, that magic wand waving classroom that uh, we were describing. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Have Take a care. great night. We'll chat soon. Well, as always, both John and I learned so much from the Math Mentoring Moment uh, episodes like this one here. Uh, we love just digging into some of these challenges. And as Jim Strachan says, it's like whether that's just, you know, a tiny little bead of sand, like one of those little tiny grains of sand, or whether it's a massive boulder, it's great to be able to have a conversation with folks just like you uh, becoming vulnerable and really just trying to get it out there. Oftentimes just chatting about it can uh, mm -hmm. allow people to sort of almost emerge their own next steps in order to grapple with this uh, this challenge that they might have in front of them. So hopefully you learned something here today and uh, hey, where are you going to write it down? Are you going to tell a neighbor? Are you going to leave us a comment uh, on YouTube? Are you going to maybe leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts? Uh, a rating and a review is a great spot for you to give us some feedback and let us know what you learned from this episode here today. Yeah, maybe they're going to be uh, jumping over to our free private Facebook group, Math Momakers K-12, to uh, or maybe hit the the blog, uh, which is the makemathmoments.com, and uh, check out some of the posts over there. Um, or maybe, Kyle, they will flip the switch here and uh, join us for... Uh, a math moment maker episode themselves. Uh, we remember that. Uh, remember that we only have episodes like this because of folks like, like Megan here who reached out to us and uh, asked for uh, a conversation on their her pebble. And uh, you can also do that as well. Just fill out a little form here. It's a one question form. Talk, tell us a little bit about what pebble you have. Um, talking about that pebble can often, you know, dislodge it uh, in your classroom, make a world of difference, but also make a world of difference for other teachers who are going through that exact same pebble. So head on over to makemathmoments.com forward slash mentor. That's makemathmoments.com forward slash mentor. Fill out the form and we'll have a chat. 
I love it. I love it. Hey, show notes, links to resources and full transcripts, uh, including uh, I, I tucked in a couple links in these mm -hmm. show notes, uh, mm -hmm. a couple division units that we have. One's called Sowing Seeds. The other is called Niagara Falls. Uh, they involve division. They also share strategies and models, uh, one of which is the area or array model uh, that we shared or highlighted in this episode. So those are tucked away in the resources over at makemathmoments.com forward slash episode 215. Alternatively, if you just hit the makemathmoments.com site, hit podcasts, and you'll see the, the episodes listed there. Give it a click and you'll be at the resource page. Well, until next time, my Math Moment Maker friends, I am Kyle Pierce. And I'm John Orr. High fives for us. And a high five for you.